So um, welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. Uh, to, today we're going to discuss the new book by Julie Bindle, Feminism for Women, The Real Route to Liberation. And uh, it's, we have Julie here to talk about the book um, and uh, to talk about it with me, Jo Brew. So this series of webinars is run by radical feminists who voices, whose voices have been cancelled or silenced in universities, schools and the media. Frustrated we can't share what we know in these places, we're offering this series of online webinars. Um, and if you've registered for this one, you will be able to come to any of the other ones with the same link. So I'm going to get uh, Julie on. Um, and oh, we need to we'll add spotlight. So thank you so much, Julie, for coming. Um, uh, we're going to talk about Julie's book, this um, Feminism for Women, for Women. The, um, the real route to liberation. And um, uh, Julie can see the chat. So I'm just going to introduce the, uh, uh, some of Julie's work. Um, so for those, those women who, haven't, who don't know about it and also introduce Julie because some, some women will not know, um, not know. So Julie Bindle is a journalist. She's a writer and broadcaster and researcher. She's been active in the global campaign to end violence towards women and children since 1979 and has written extensively on rape, domestic violence, sexually motivated murder, prostitution and trafficking, child sex, sexual exploitation, stalking and the rise of religious fundamentalism and its harm against women and girls. She's regularly on TV and radio. Now you can find out more about Julie on her website, www.thejuliebindle.com, where you can you can read. I've I've just been reading from that. So you can um you can get more information about that. Um there's I think a lot of us have read this book. But um, some of us haven't and haven't ha yet had the opportunity to read it. So um, I'm going to ask Julie if you could tell us, um, first of all, what, 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 what made you write the book and what's in it? What's the main sort of aim of the book? And well, first of all, thank you very much, Joe, for, for hosting this. Um, I really appreciate the, the opportunity <clears throat> excuse me, to talk to feminists on a Sunday morning. It, the, the motivation for this book was young women, young feminists and young women who are being fed a lie about what feminism is, which has occurred to very many of us um, on here, that's more beneficial to men than to women. So the whole notion of empowerment and personal choice and freedom that gets related to issues that are extremely harmful, such as prostitution, stripping, all, all manner of the sex trade, including pornography, religious fundamentalism, um, marriage, heterosexual marriage, marriage in general. The issues that feminists have long campaigned against and issues that have in some ways become more, uh, more urgent, such as the porn industry. And then I would hear from young women at universities and other settings where I'd either spoken at about male violence or I'd attempted to speak at and were deplatformed or picketed and heckled during the talks. And they would tell me that they were maybe initially part of that group within the feminist society or the LGBTQQI society to get me deplatformed to get me banned, to discredit me. And many of these young women said that they now regretted it. And in fact, they could see that the men and some of the handmaidens were trying to stop real feminists from coming to these settings to talk because it was threatening. Because of course, once we name male violence in the way that we do, it becomes very uncomfortable, particularly for heterosexual women, women with sons, women in general. So I wanted the book to outline some of the basic principles of feminism that are not outdated, that are not irrelevant, looking at the ways in which women are being silenced 
and also to pose a direct challenge to men and to anti-feminists to say, what kind of society do you want to live in? And how on earth can you possibly call yourself a feminist if what you're doing is propping up the sex trade or saying that there's no harm, in fact, it's liberation, it's a liberatory um, scenario to, to declare the end of se women's sex-based rights and single sex spaces. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's the, it's the first book we've had in the last, say, three or four years that's got in, into the sort of big mainstream book. We've had books by quite a few women who either are new to feminism or say, I've never really been a feminist, but I'm just writing about sort of issues that are of importance to women. Uh, but it's really fantastic to have your book because you've been involved since, is it 1979? Uh, 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 right, right at the centre of the key parts of feminism, or, or as we, as sort of radical feminists, certainly, and many feminists would say, are the main areas of the violence against women, anti prostitution, and anti pornography, um, and other and and lesbian issues, loads of things. Can you tell us a bit about how you came to feminism and lesbian feminism? And w w just for women who don't know what you've been doing, what what uh, recap that a bit? Well, I I grew up in a, a working class uh, environment in the northeast of England, where there were no jobs, no opportunities for working class girls. I was a, I was a lesbian. I was kind of outed at school at fifteen, although I think I was probably on the way to definitely outing myself. And that wasn't a pleasant experience. And of course, the word lesbian um, was just a, a, an absolutely appalling word um, then. And, and unfortunately, we seem to have gone full circle, but with a progressive cloak to it. Um, there was always the threat of sexual violence uh, and abuse, punishment for digressing. I did meet one or two gay young gay men uh, who took me to gay clubs which wasn't particularly for me and I wanted to meet other women and be able to talk about being a lesbian and what it all meant and was it really shameful and did that mean there was something wrong with me and so I kind of gravitated to um I, I moved to Leeds uh, in the north of England a city in the north of England because I knew that there were lesbians there um, and I moved there with with my girlfriend who worked there and who knew it was a thriving hub of the best feminism imaginable and of course lesbianism and feminism were pretty indivisible then you know I was 17 years old it was the very end of 1979 the women I met were all about 15 years older than me they had gone through the left, many of them had been to university, they had uh, read books, they understood feminist theory, they were developing feminist theory. And so I was a real rookie, I was very, very naive and young, but learned from them, found women only spaces because we we're lesbians, of course, that's what we were going to do. Not only did we not want to hang out with men, but we weren't welcome anywhere in mainstream society. And the women that I met were campaigning uh, to end male violence against women. And it was at the time that Peter Sutcliffe, a serial killer, um, was uh, raping and murdering women, some of whom were prostituted, some of whom weren't, around the north of England. And the police decided quite early on that you know, these women were worth less than other women and the media followed suit and the reporting and the police investigation into these crimes uncovered, um, deep-rooted, barely concealed misogyny in all our institutions and amongst men everywhere. And at the time, the porn industry was thriving because there were sex cinemas opening, showing the most misogynistic depictions of women and, and actual real live women being abused on camera. 
And there was plenty to campaign against in terms of male violence and everything else fell into place. And so through those women, I then met others, feminists in universities, for example, such as Jalna Hanna, who brought women's studies to the UK, where they were talking about domestic violence, femicide, the murder of women and girls because we're women and girls, and campaigning to end the police practice that allowed this to happen, and also to call men to task. There was also a very vibrant campaign to criminalise rape in marriage, because of course that only happened in 1992 in England and Wales because of feminist campaigning. There were conferences um, and there were, you know, we, we set up the very first lesbian line in the country. And so there were fortnightly meetings, discos, where we would socialise and talk about girlhood and talk about the experience of being raised as girls under patriarchy. Um, and and I want that's not not around the uh, anymore, is it? The, what you experience of being able to talk to older women and learn from them, I, I, I've, my understanding is a lot of it isn't available now to young women, so they're getting their information from social media. So this is why it, this book's very useful. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, I want I want the things I had for young women. I don't mean to go back because we can never go back and nor should we. Political movements should always be in flux, should always be developing alongside the context. And I think social media is a fantastic opportunity for women to, to get, I mean, we're, we're, look at us doing this now. Um, you know, we would be doing this pandemic or, or no pandemic because we need to connect with each other um, across continents, across you know, corners of the globe. But but what I've seen is the way that young women are being bullied and sexually harassed on social media. And that there are no spaces, as you've just pointed out, Joe, there are there are very few spaces for young lesbians that aren't completely sexualized or where they're defined as queer. And what that means is that men are welcomed and not just welcomed, but they dominate the scene completely. So for, for, for young lesbians today, it's no wonder that many are defining as queer or non-binary or gay if they're posh, um, because the word lesbian has become yet again stigmatized. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, just just sort of continuing because it, we're, I, I diverted us from talking a little bit about your early career. Um, one of the things that's very notable and sort of, you know, we're just in awe of what you've done um, is that when the second wave sort of petered out by about the 90s or sort of late 80s, um, that was when you sort of redoubled your efforts and set up the Justice for Women organisation and kept massive amounts of incredibly important work going through those years when m many, many women were not active. Can you tell us about that? What what kept you going during those those bad years, those un inactive years? Not for you, of course. <laughs> well, no. well, no, I mean, those years were pretty bad. Um, it was when we saw the kind of, we called them femocrats, the, the women who defined as feminists but took a salary which of course they were entitled to but called that their feminism between nine and five and and fought mainly for equality as opposed to liberation and so that the movement was defanged um but i moved to london from leeds in 1987 and in leeds was the it had a very long title the leeds women's campaign for Justice for Women, which had been set up before we founded Justice for Women in 1990. Sandra McNeil, uh, a very, very old and dear friend um, who spent her entire life campaigning to end male violence, was one of the key members there. And Sandra was one of the women that I met when I was 18 years old when I moved to Leeds. And she she's always played an extremely key part in my life and my feminism. And that campaign was directly addressing um, deadly male violence, domestic violence as it's known. And so we took our lead from that and also Southall Black Sisters, a group based in London, 
fantastic, absolutely brilliant, um, inspiring group of feminists were campaigning for a woman called Kirinjit Alawalia, who had killed her extremely violent husband and had been convicted of murder. <coughs> Excuse me. And South All Black Sisters were looking at the way that race um, and um, sex were intertwined uh, and used against her, Kirin did, during her murder trial. It was, it was assumed that she was um, somehow different from other women, that she would carry out such an extraordinary act of violence on her husband, that the, the, the violence towards her was minimised. Um, she was duly convicted and South All Black Sister stepped in. And there were women who came forward in the press when they saw the campaign by SBS, who were in prison, such as Sarah Thornton, who had killed her violent husband and also had been convicted of his murder. And so we decided to set up a campaign to look at those issues. And of course, as always happens, because men do have a habit of killing women, there was a man called Joseph McGrail around the time that Sarah Thornton lost her first appeal that we supported, who killed his quote unquote nagging wife, Marion, and was not convicted of murder, was convicted of the lesser charge of manslaughter, given a very, very light sentence, I think maybe even a non-custodial. And the judge said that this woman would have tried the patience of a saint. So that juxtapositioning of a woman who had killed in order to save her own life, the life, the lives of their children, after years of sadistic torture and threats to her life, with a man who said he was nagged by a woman who just irritated him to the point where he throttled her or beat her to death, was such um, a stark example of misogyny and the injustice faced by women throughout the entire criminal justice system as victims and defendants, that we just went gung-ho. And we organized a huge march through London with loads of other women's organizations that had 2000 participants. And yes, it was a kind of beginning of something new, but it was also a continuation of the hard graft that had been put in by women throughout the 80s and, and way before. And in 1989, um, of course, there'd been the Montreal massacre. Um, I described the killer, Mark Lapine, who killed 14 engineering students, female engineering students, as the first incel that I had come across because he, he had decided that women had taken away his opportunity to become an engineer. He couldn't get a girlfriend. He hated feminists. Feminists were to blame for everything. He stormed the engineering department at the Polytechnic, shot the women dead. Um, and of course, the Montreal feminists completely um, disrupted the media and police narrative that he was just crazy, that he was deranged, that there was something wrong with him. They looked at his upbringing, what had his mother done to make him turn into this mass killer. When, of course, the feminists knew this was misogyny, this was a backlash against the gains that feminists had made across Canada. And so, th so that was the kind of, for me, that was the first bit of global feminism. Um, it was making connections, you know, across thousands of miles with women who were campaigning on the same issues that we were. Yeah, and that's, I'm just going to advertise your book again. Um, this, if you haven't, read it or got it it's really really highly recommended uh, everything that julie's talking about and a lot more i mean we, we we won't have time to cover everything is in the book and it's it's a very um so it's an easy read and it's very um well it's just great to be able to hear your views of your experience and that linking some of these issues together like the violence against women and then how that violence was ignored as a as violence against women and it links up to incels and it's also continuation and it affects all women so there are there are loads of really 
fantastic quotes that I think for a few years to come, we'll have lots of memes coming out of this book <laughs> because there's some really, really sort of succinct, clear uh, bits of feminist theory or feminist ideas explaining what's happening there. Um, so it definitely highly recommended. Another thing in the book that I, I've uh, really enjoyed is that you, because you've been campaigning and you've been active in feminism for such a long time, you've met uh, loads and loads and loads of very important feminist, um, feminists and also been involved in incredibly important campaigns. And you sort of weave that into your book. So it, it feels as if you're not just hearing from you, Julie, you're also encountering um, uh, well over a hundred very significant feminists um, and, and women's activists. So that's that's a, a, a really enjoyable thing. So um, for, for people who haven't read it, uh, in, in here you, you get to meet or talk uh, Julie's talks to um, Martina Navratilova and um, can you tell us about some of the people you met um, or you talked to for the book and so it's also new as well which is very interesting. Well one of the really nice interviews that I did was with uh, Chimamanda Ngozi who of course is you know one of the world's leading literary figures, An absolutely brilliant feminist who has positioned herself um, in the campaigns, of course, against racism, colonialism, misogyny and the like. She's she's an extremely important figure and very, very influential, but dared to say trans women are trans women when there was an attempt to coerce her to saying trans women are women. And of course, everybody knows that trans women are trans women, um, including trans identified males. But this was enough to get her cancelled as a white feminist, because of <laughs> course she is. And many of those that are labelling her white feminist are of course white men. And we had a great conversation about misogyny and about racism. And she said to me, you know, I'm more angry about misogyny because my, you know, the group of people that I mix with, hang out with, love, spend my life with are black and they get how racism works and articulate it very, very well. But many of them refuse to accept sexism as a twin institution. And so we had that really good conversation that showed me how fragile anyone's feminism is if we don't really stick to our guns and support women who are being bullied, who have perhaps less status in the world. Maybe we don't know their names. Maybe they can't afford to lose that job that they would lose dare they say something robust about male violence yeah. or about transgender ideology or whatever. And she's one of those women that sees it as her responsibility to mentor and support other women. And the same with Martina Navratilova. She was a great ally to the whole LGBTQQI two spirit plus uh, community, whatever that is. Um, and fairly liberal about it. You know, she would talk about how important it was to be an ally, etc. And then, of course, because she pointed out how unfair it is to include natal males in uh, competitive sports with women, she then became the enemy. She was a bigot, a fascist who deserved to die in a grease fire, yada, yada, yada. And through that experience, understood it as misogyny, because that's all it is. That's all the extreme trans ideology is. It's misogyny. Yeah. And um, yeah, uh, if I um, one, I'm in uh, uh, the sort of area of feminism I'm in. I, I call myself a radical feminist and and um, I 
uh, there's been a discussion in the, this bit of the bit of feminism that I'm uh, hang out in that it's useful to what, what, what we've been coming to the conclusion is it's useful to call instead of calling people who say they're trans women trans women we have come to a sort of position of saying they're men with a gender identity and um that there are some advantages in doing that we've found i i sort of listened to the arguments i was calling them trans women or trans women and then a few women were saying but if you call them if you call them men then it so it makes it's it's better it's clearer so we've been doing that um and i think there's quite a quite a, a group of women who find that um I mean, that around we've got this women's human rights campaign and declaration on women's sex-based rights we tend to use the terminology men with a gender identity which i know i know i in your book you use a lot of i mean you use so many brilliant terms and it's so useful and you at some stages call say men who identify as women but you also sometimes say it's um you can say trans women are trans women and is that do you find that uh that sort of workable as a because you still get attacked <laughs> for just the fact that you don't say they're women you're just absolutely under attack but do you find why do, why do you find that a, a re, an okay formulation well you know uh editors and publishers have their own policies and their own house style that you can push at and you can challenge but only to a degree so i'll give you an example i did an interview with one of the women sexually assaulted by a man in a women's prison he was masquerading uh, he 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 identified as a woman and he was a convicted sex offender and of course uh, this is what happened when he was placed in the women's estate which is nothing short of a disgrace. And this woman who is actually uh, taking the case against the prison service spoke out and I interviewed her. And of course she referred to him as he. And we had that discussion before the interview. I told her my view, which is that this was a man who, and she, she, can, she can describe him however she wishes and I will quote her and use that description. And she said, no, he's a man, he. And then, of course, the editor changed it. And I think some groups are actually challenging the editor um, through the complaints procedure, which is right and good and fair. And I support that. Um, before I had this, this book published, I was pretty much, um, uh, I'd sold it to about three different publishing houses. And the one I am going to mention is Virago, because it's supposed to be a feminist publishing house. And I think they've become one of the worst in terms of capitulation to trans ideology. And the deal was pretty much done and dusted. You know, it was the usual taking you out for dinner, you know, congratulating my agent, all of that stuff. And then, of course, they took the book into acquisitions, which is where it signed off. And the beards in the publishing houses, the dude bros, the brokerlists, said, well, if you publish Julie Bindle's book, we're walking. And instead of saying, well, walk, if you can afford to lose your job, you privileged little shit, go ahead. But instead they capitulated. So I have now got a great publisher and it's out there and it's doing really well. And I had to make some compromises and you have to make a decision um, when you're in the media or in the public eye about, do you get your work out there? Or do you decide to be as pure as pure and not budge on anything at all in order that you can be uncompromising in every yeah. other way. I mean, I think that that's uh, that. I mean, it's great. Uh, that's what some of the, some of the women who are, said we should ask this uh, thought was the case. And um, I mean, the fact is you're but getting the word out, getting the message out is fantastic. And the, the, so much so much of um the you know it'll be it, you you're going to be able to reach really large numbers of people so um so that's um and if that's the only way to do it it's, it seems like that's the way it is and i mean it's the same as jk rowling and Chimana, chimamanda uh who 
it, are uh, sort of saying that, taking that position, but then being very clear that there are women's sex-based rights, which is runs all the way through your book. So I think I think that's um, uh, that's good. And I mean, just so that it, that uh, I think it's good also to have other parts of the women's movement articulating other formulations and speaking so that we because because it's a journey and we're together working on things that if we um if we have a variety of voices then um some of us who are sort of much less well known can be articulating possibly sort of harder line and mm -hmm. and making slightly different arguments and i sort of linked up to that a bit i one of the things that i thought was quite inter or very interesting and quite new in your book was you were saying it's feminism for for women mm -hmm. um which makes that very clear point to young women that you have to triangulate and see is is anal sex really great for women is that and is it in the interests but um also it's i'm sort of reading in the book that you're saying at this stage we should unite um you know we should turn against misogyny in uh, you know this would be a good thing for us to do to sort of a, sort of a call in a way for for the women's movement to fight together to, is that is that a correct reading yeah you know the what's described as a culture war but i just see as as, as men tooling themselves up against women in the past decade has resulted in uh, the opposite of solidarity between women and we're constantly reminded, often by anti-feminists and non-feminists, of what divides women. So the new spate of books, um, such as Against White Feminism, which um, you know has been uh, quite widely reviewed, if anyone's interested, which is kind of pointing the finger at a kind of feminism that is not white feminism at all, it's just feminism and using it to attack that feminism um, by, by assuming the moral position um, as a woman of colour who has every right to do this. Well, of course, black women, women of colour, um, will critique a feminism that excludes women of colour or that is racist, of course. The women's movement has been very good at doing that relative to uh, the rest of the left. And of course, feminism was never white feminism. It's always been um, a diverse group of women, including working class women who are often forgotten working together. Um, and, and so the lack of solidarity and the constant aggressive reminders of what tears us apart is really very, very damaging to the campaign to end male violence. Because as I say in the book, the only thing that unites women everywhere around the world, all women, all girls, whoever and wherever we are, is the fear and reality of male violence. And that is the one issue that unites us. And it is a huge issue. I mean, I, I agree with that in terms of it's the truth and because violence against some women uh, influences every every woman, but there are quite a lot of rich, protected women who go to nice schools and then they go to university and they become doctors and then they, through whatever, maybe because they've got lots of money, they manage to f marry a nice man who does who isn't violent. Uh, that the, they can say to themselves it's not affecting them and I think that is a that I think and maybe these femocrats that you talked about in the 1990s sort of said well we're not dealing with that which is a massive error but I think there are some women who don't think it affects them and I mean they're wrong but yeah um I I want to go to something in the chat and then also just in in the book as well it's it's the um oh well the, no sorry I want to ask this question first about we had Sylvia, we talked about Sylvia Federici's book and she talks about the first stage of um, the economic system we're in. And it's, she says that violence causes primitive accumulation. So she's talking economically about how men end up having so much more money than us and so much more power. And it's caused by violence. So I think she cites 
violence against women as the foundational structure of our economic system, capitalism. And is is, is that right? That I mean, I guess you, it sounds as if you do think that violence against women, if there's any one thing, the core thing that's the basis of patriarchy is that. Yeah. Yes, I mean, it's the method to keep women subordinate. And, you know, as many feminists have said, it's not necessary for you know, men to hold guns or knives against women's heads and throats for us all to uh, feel uh, scared, frightened, subordinate, to be positioned as subordinate. But it, it is only necessary for some to do it, enough to do it, that it serves as a warning. Now, obviously, feminism is for all women, but not all women are feminists and many women are anti-feminist. And there's a strand of, of US feminism that is very much concerned with the glass ceiling as opposed to the women at the bottom. And I'm much more concerned with the women at the bottom and not about a pay differentiation of 10% uh, when your salary is a million pounds. Clearly it's sexism, but why would we prioritize that fight? Why would we prioritize that struggle when that woman, um, as rich and privileged as she is, is still, of course, at risk of male violence and will, to a degree, far less and in different ways to less privileged women, will curtail her life and her freedom because of that threat. So, so that's, I suppose, looking at what unites women as opposed to what divides us, whilst at the same time not ignoring the issues that are extremely important to sort out within any political movement, such as class prejudice, racism, etc. Yeah. So there's one other the question I was going to ask is this. In the book, sometimes you talk about um, men who say they've got their women uh, as he and sometimes as she. And there's a there's the, the argument again that that's um, it's difficult if um, if we sometimes call them she and sometimes call them he. And what do you think about that? Because some some women say we should just always call them he. Is it, what's yeah? Okay, so I think probably I'll just revert to my previous answer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, and you know, there's I know that you know I, I can have. I'm glancing at the the message thread, and of course there are there are many women, many feminist initiatives. They're absolutely right to do this. That are just obsessively going on and on and on about this issue and not relating to or focusing on any other part of this book, which is dealing with issues of male violence and the women and feminist campaign to end male violence. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an ongoing discussion and and it's valid and it's, you know, it's it's OK to have to to discuss how how strategically how we're going to win this and how we can fight patriarchy and we're in slightly different positions and but it it's so it's 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 good to have have to sort of discuss it and Ooh. to think about it and think about uh different words like i i find that through chatting to people i end up changing the words i use sometimes and i, I think uh was that there was one guy was it miranda yardley who a few years ago there are a couple of men trans <laughs> Men, males who have changed their position and they've they've started saying trans women are men and they they I think it's through the debate because we're part of a big movement at the moment that change and discussion happens which seems sort of good absolutely yeah um there are many types of feminism as we all know many of them are counterproductive um yeah can you tell us about so, so I think a lot of women know but tell us yeah I mean, you know, we know that liberal feminism isn't feminism. And, you know, we, we talk about language here. It is a tricky one, isn't it? Because the reason why I don't use the term radical feminist in the book, I just use the term feminist, is because I, I don't accept that any of the others are feminism. You know, there may be progressive movements in their view. It might be that they are leftist movements. Who knows? But they're not feminist movements. So how do I describe liberal feminism when I don't accept it as feminism? So it's masquerading as feminism uh, in the way that some men uh, masquerade as women. And so the type of feminism that's counterproductive is, as I said earlier, that that 
constantly hits women over the head with what divides us as opposed to what unites us. And the choice feminism, the, the idea that somehow sexual objectification, abuse and violence can be empowering. And the feminism that positions men in senior roles in, in feminism, that insists that men can be feminists, that apologises to the one man in the room at a conference because she might have said something gently critical of men as a class. You know, that's not feminism. But it doesn't mean that those women don't have a right to define their own feminism. But unless we have an agreed basic set of principles, aims and objectives, then we can't call ourselves a credible movement, which is why at the beginning of the book, I, I spend much of one of the chapters defining feminism for me, yeah. what feminism means to me. And I think that we, we need that definition. It is our, not, not just our prerogative, but it's actually our responsibility to have that definition. Because otherwise, all this nonsense about Margaret Thatcher was a feminist, Beyonce is a feminist, you know, just gives the impression to young women that feminism is anything they want it to be. And it's about an individual identity and it's not, it's a political movement. Yeah. Can I um, also, I mean, through your book, you, you, you talk about surrogacy, prostitution, porn and violence against women and fighting all of those and law changes in relation to all of those, many of which you've been involved in. Can you tell us how those, you know, why it's so important, what knits them together and and also also where wh what are you focusing most on now are you um which which area or is it all of them well you know I've always uh, had well not always but but since the the 1990s mid 1990s you know I've committed myself to speaking out as much as possible against the normalization of prostitution and the global sex trade and that will remain a priority. I can't imagine that it that it wouldn't be. Um, and the sex trade survivor movement is vibrant and it's growing and it's international and it's been very effective. But also, you know, for example, last week I interviewed a woman who was married to um, a man called Sam Pibus, who choked a woman to death, he says during sex, he says consensually, the rough sex defence, which I'm sure many of us have heard of, that was in fact abolished in 2020 in the domestic uh, abuse bill, thanks to campaigners such as we can't consent to this, a great group of women. And Louise, who was married to Sam Pivas, after Sophie Moss, the woman who he murdered in my view, was killed, um, she spoke out about him and that that was a big deal for, for Louise his ex-partner because she had to lay bare some of the very personal aspects of her relationship with him which was also abusive and she's done this because Sam Pibus was given four years in prison for manslaughter as opposed to the murder conviction and the life sentence he should have got for killing this woman because she was seen as worthless and because he used a defense which should not have been available to him and is based on deep-rooted misogyny. She asked for it. I strangled her during sex. She liked a bit of light choking. I didn't intend to hurt her. And so I will always campaign against the normalization of male violence, femicide. And let's face it, there's enough to keep us busy for a long time. But with What's a vision. That? So we've got, um, uh, unfortunately, Julie has to go uh, in six minutes because you have to go to an, uh, an, uh, another event or something. So we normally go on uh, for 20 more minutes or 15 more minutes, but she's going to go soon. So um, uh, I just uh, want to ask about young women again and then, then, you know, say if you want to add anything else. But how do you think it's going with reaching young women uh, uh, sort of managing to discuss things with them and can they hear you are you are you still being de-platformed de at universities and things oh yeah of course i mean there'll always be that um th th that threat of being de-platformed wherever i get asked to speak but i had a book launch uh, on the 1st of september at conway hall in london and it you know it was sold out within about 
a week um, of it going online. So there were 400 there, overwhelmingly women, a handful of men. And this is because women, of course, are hungry for feminism, for real feminism. And we had a great panel and it was a brilliant evening. But what really warmed my heart and left me feeling euphorically happy was the fact that at the end of that evening, I signed well over 100 books to women in their 20s and younger. Some had come with their moms, some had come because they wanted to hear the kind of feminism that we had on the panel. Um, others were curious, some had started out hostile, but they were there and they bought the book. And I get messages from young women all the time, mainly at universities, I'd love to reach working class women because as we know universities are now uh, pretty you know, elite institutions again. So it is out there, it is being well reviewed and picked up by, by young women. And that's why I wrote the book and that's who I dedicated the book to. Because of course, when I was a young feminist, I was mentored and supported by older feminists. And that's what we should be doing. Yeah, and I mean, I would add to that, that the young women I know um, and work with are most shocked and horrified by uh, when, the, if they get a boyfriend and they're not being told by schools, they're not being told lesbianism is an option. They're just being told, you've somehow got to find a nice boyfriend and then they're just horrific in the they're, they're just you know the 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 everyone's invited movement that happened last year in london um where loads of girls are saying this is just horrifically intolerable it's it's worse so i'm sort of thinking that can be you've got a lot of answers to that in this book and um so that's talking about solutions to those problems the porn problem and prostitution and trafficking and surrogacy a lot of young women don't know anything about surrogacy which you've worked on a lot as well oh you're still on mute yeah um surrogacy is a big issue and in some ways it's more difficult to disseminate the arguments against it from a feminist perspective than it is prostitution in some ways prostitution is a bigger problem globally in terms of the sheer numbers of sorry, of um of women involved sorry my... that's probably your timer that you need to get going um so surrogacy is a huge issue because people just see it as a right to have their own biological children and disregard um the women whose wombs are being trafficked and used for their benefit and disregard the women who sell their eggs um and and risk you know serious harm psychological and physical and of course this is um no better example of the meeting of uber capitalism and patriarchy the renting of women's wombs and of course the selling of baby uh, of breast milk which I, I investigated in cambodia so so they're they're really huge issues and it's all about the battles by men against women's bodies and sexual violence it all comes down to that and that's why feminism has to be the has to center women and girls and not be co-opted by those that tell us what feminism should be because that ends up being a feminism for men yeah well julie thank you so much it was um so we've had julie bindle and i'm going to show your book again uh feminism for women um the real route to liberation i really highly recommend it we'll put this on youtube and we will share um i've got the the uh, young women I work with, we're having a book, a reading group, so we'll get back to you. And I'm sure loads of women uh, in the chat will sort of give you feedback and, you know, how we're getting the message out. It's an incredibly uh, inspiring book. And thank you so much for talking to us and, and being frank with us on the couple of, you know, differences of opinion. But the great thing is if we can talk and we can show our, you know, the massive support for your work and, you know, uh, even though we have a couple of differences, which, um, uh, and, and also you explained very clearly uh, some of the, the reasons for those uh, things. But thank you so much. And um, uh, well, we'll get, we'll send in the, send you the YouTube thing. And we've had, we normally have about 80 women on our Radical Feminist Perspectives. We've got 152 today. <laughs> so that's a lot, a lot of women. I'm sure everybody's here to see you. And uh, really, I can see in the chat, absolutely loads of thanks. So. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Okay.
Bye, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. Oh, I need to say next week. Oh, I think Julie's gone. I'm going to just post in um, to everybody the next week's. Um, Julie has to go to a meeting, which is why she's gone so quickly. But oh, no, that's the wrong one. So I'm not going to post that. Um, uh, I, I'm just going next week we have a discussion and I, I'll just get it up so you can actually see it. We've got a discussion about uh, Andrea, Andrea Dworkin's intercourse. And um, if you've registered for this, which you must have if you're here, then you don't need to register again. I'll just put it into the post. We'll send out um, uh, uh uh, an invitation to it. So it is um, uh, uh, Madalika Agarwal and Sheila Jeffries, 10 a.m. UK time, talking about intercourse by Andrea Dworkin. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming and um, maybe see you next week.